Welcome to another episode of FGG, otherwise known as Fucking Great Games. Uh, this is episode four. It's going to be a little bit different today. Um, this is AS Inquisitor's uh, long form uh, podcast for those of you that don't know. And usually I have a co host here. Oh, there's my uh, eye messages. My lovely wife and also co-host messaging me um usually i have my co-host uh john here and john and i uh for those of you that don't know um well once a month usually sit down and we'll do a three hour um law format podcast and we'll cover you know all sorts of stuff sometimes it'll be more pop culture inclined um other times, I think we've even dived into, like, politics and things like that. Um, very rarely, though. The, the primary focus of the podcast is to pick more, like, nostalgic or retro games and franchises and uh, discuss them, you know, our memories with them growing up, uh, old consoles, uh, things along those lines. Our favorites, our dislikes. Uh, and there's, it works great with him in particular because we've known each other since we were 15, um, and we're both 31 now and we're able to kind of bounce off of each other. And then if we disagree on something, which happens quite a bit, actually, it's about 50, 50 spread. Uh, we can have a discussion about it without kind of like tearing each other down because we've known each other for so long. And then also after we're done recording, um, you know, there's, there's no bad blood. Like we have a lot of these conversations, those types of conversations at least, um, privately anyways. So it's like, you might as well record them every once in a while. However, this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, him and I didn't have a chance to record, uh, a podcast together this month. However, I don't want to miss an episode or a month since they're so spaced out. So I think every once in a while, um, if him and I can't, uh, spend the time recording a podcast, then I will just do a shorter one, uh, probably about an hour, depending on uh, the content or how long I want to go. And it'll just be me. And we'll be able to roll through some, uh, you know, questions that people have asked, either, you know, on my streams or maybe something from another podcast but doesn't quite pertain there. Things are kind of along those lines. But anyways, I hope you guys stay tuned and kind of stick with it. And um, if you like this format, I can definitely do more of them. I've had some ideas of maybe doing some podcast mini series, um, like four parts or six parts or something like that. Like maybe just myself running solo and uh, doing a podcast mini series where I focus either like, you know, each each podcast would be on a specific game and then the entire series would be a franchise, something along those lines. But, and then again, for those of you that don't know, my name is Anthony Schultz. So I'm a co-owner, co-founder of AS Inquisitor, uh, my wife and I's company. Um, we've slowly kind of grown, grown a little bit. I'll actually do a little bit of, um, uh, I don't know, of an update. Uh, as far as how the company's going, for those of you that are curious, I mean, if you only listen to this, you only have a handful of episodes. So you, you may be curious as to um, what what is going on with AS Inquisitor, or what is AS Inquisitor even, because we still are fairly young and new. Um, so essentially, I used to work uh, as a grocery manager for a big store, uh, Fred Meyer specifically. I worked for actually Safeway before that. Uh, and I was in that industry for about 12 years. Uh, in the middle of that, I had finished up my uh, English degree. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in English, uh, creative writing specifically, with a specialization in fiction and a few minors and stuff that kind of add to that. But, and I worked as a journalist. So And I did a little bit of games journalism. Um, I primarily actually did uh, comic book journalism. That was kind of my niche. So I did comic book previews, and I interviewed artists and writers, and I reviewed um, comic book issues. Not tradebacks per se. I did every once in a while, but mostly I did like a weekly 
uh, content. I, you know, my pull list was pretty much everything from uh, DC, Marvel, Image, and then if uh, any of the the big two at least had you know some like mature imprints going on, like uh, Vertigo and uh, things like that. But anyways. Uh, the inception of ASI kind of started then. Uh, I had a friend at the time. We started a YouTube channel where we uh, reviewed liquor, actually. And that really, like, grew and kind of blew up. And it was something where we, we posted episodes, like, twice a week. And between himself, myself, and my wife, we kind of brainstormed. And he, a big gamer as well, uh, brainstormed AS Inquisitor and, like, the name and the logo um, we started doing some let's talks, um, even podcasting a little bit. There is kind of a secret, uh, hidden season of rage quit. I don't know if it's still available online, but it used to be, um, hosted through SoundCloud. So, <coughs> but yeah, if you can scrounge that up, you can kind of see here are some of the really early like podcasting work that AS Inquisitor did. Uh, anyways, it got to the point where my wife and I, we had a kid and we had just bought a house and, uh, my job became increasingly stressful. I was working between 60 and 80 hours a week, uh, oftentimes six days a week. And I just didn't see my family anymore. So it started to affect Ariel and I's relationship and, uh, I wasn't seeing my newborn son. And, and then I, consequently, I started to develop some health issues from it. And so, uh, her and I discussed what to do and inevitably I had to kind of pull the trigger and I resigned from my position and, uh, Ariel actually went back to work and then I became a stay at home dad. And then we started planning what we wanted our, our company, uh, AS Inquisitor to be. Um, and so that ended up including um, streaming on uh, Twitch. Um, and then we we branched into bot- podcasting, specifically with uh, Rage Quit, was our first one, which is more of our uh, PlayStation or Sony-centric podcast. Uh, we cover kind of like general video game topics there as well, but uh, that's definitely like the oldest of them. And then um, how to do YouTube content. What kind of content we wanted to do for the AS Inquisitor YouTube channel. There was already some content on there before um, from its infancy days when I was working uh, grocery still on doing On the Rocks, uh, the liquor review YouTube channel. But now, though, flash forward uh, about a year, almost a year now. Um, we've got three podcasts. So this one that you're listening to, FGG, uh, long format pon- podcast uh, that John and I usually do. Um, and him and I kind of rekindled our friendship and it's always kind of been rooted in gaming anyways. And so that's really fun to do. Um, Ariel, uh, my wife and co-host and co-founder and owner of AS Inquisitor, um, really enjoys Nintendo like specifically that like those are her kind of consoles and games that she enjoys. She's not a huge, huge gamer, but she does play. So we decided at the beginning of this year to do a weekly podcast called 64 bits of rage. So I urge you guys to go check that out. And then rage quit is just kind of ebbing up there in episodes. Uh, we got some new equipment to make the audio sound better, more crisp. Um, I've kind of found my own as far as doing the graphic design for, you know, whether it be like a YouTube thumbnail or, um, just the podcasting thumbnails or, you know, collections and playlists and all that kind of the more like nitty gritty work that I was familiar with when I freelanced, uh, as a writer, but hadn't specifically done for content creation. Uh, we stream five days a week now on Twitch, uh, kind of bled more into like a retro, uh, gaming and consoles and that kind of fanfare. We also do new stuff as well, like um, Borderlands 3 is one of our big series, Days Gone. We did Doom Eternal is coming up. Animal Crossing is coming up. We'll be doing some Final Fantasy VII Remake, things like that. So we do intermix uh, new titles and games to kind of catch that, things that we're interested in specifically to kind of catch that wave as it kind of crests. And then... Um, 
as that ebbs back down, we fall back into uh, retro or classic games and systems, and we stream them natively from uh, the classic consoles. So kind of get like a truer picture of what it was like. Um, and then, yeah, I stream a little bit on YouTube now, and then we just revised how we're going to do YouTube, uh, what kind of content we're going to have, uh, how many uploads every week, you know, what we, what we can feasibly do and keep the quality high, which is very important. Um, we had some difficulties with YouTube just because of the FTCs, like regulations on like children's content and things like that. And unfortunately, we are a video game based company. And so we were waiting for that to kind of shake loose. And we didn't see a lot of growth there until I started streaming on YouTube. Um, now we have steady growth and uh, comments and likes and watch time, which is really cool to see. And so we want to vary up the content, you know, do what works still, of course, uh, but then add some kind of new layers in. So one of the reasons that my co-host John isn't here um, is because instead of recording a podcast, um, we ended up doing an unboxing video. And it's going to be our first unboxing video for the YouTube channel. Um, he was able to procure a, a limited run edition of the Power Rangers uh, fighting game, which is super cool. Uh, he brought it over and had it on his uh, like gaming laptop, and we hooked it up to my TV and played through the uh, campaign. I think like two weeks prior to us filming the unboxing. And then I found that limited run had done a, uh, a limited run of the, the game that he had brought over. And so he ended up purchasing it, even though it was after the fact. And so then we did our first unboxing video. So, and we're going to be doing more of those, um, as we have content to unbox or products, uh, we'll be posting those uh, Tuesdays on the AS Inquisitor YouTube channel. So uh, make sure and check that out if you enjoy uh, unboxing videos. But it was really cool. I don't want to spoil too much, but it's uh, Power Rangers Battle for the Grid is the game. Uh, it's a fighting game based off of a whole bunch of different Power Rangers runs. And... Uh, Limited Run Games did a standard physical version for the Switch and the PS4. So he was able to... Um, oh, and then they did a more expensive version called the Mega Edition, which just came out in November uh, 2019, actually. And he, so we did an unboxing of the Switch one. So I will be doing the voiceover, and uh, he did the the filming and the physical unboxing himself. So the hands or arms that you see uh, in that video, if you get a chance to look at it once it releases, uh, is all done. So we ended up doing that instead. I hope you guys don't mind. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the, the history and growth of AS Inquisitor, where it started at, uh, what we've been doing um, we will obviously keep pushing forward and doing new and different content. Uh, we'll also be, uh, keeping on, keeping on with our podcast. So we'll be doing FGG still. Uh, like I said, just every once in a while, it'll just be me and you talking slowly and sensually. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get through some maybe like questions, comments, and concerns or things that I've seen, you know, either on social media or in streaming chat or comments for videos and podcasts and things on the along those lines. I'll be able to answer some of those questions. So that's kind of why I wanted to talk about AS Inquisitor because I have had people all across the spectrum ask, you know, kind of what the goal is. Like, what are you doing? Like, is it a company or is it just a, a name or a handle? So... Uh, now you kind of know the gist. It is a company, and we do all sorts of different things, podcasting, streaming, video creation, um, and we're only going to grow from here. So that's that's kind of the shtick. Uh, I think now we'll get into some of the other kind of like questions or like comments that I've heard. Uh, I've had people ask... Uh, why I stream the games I stream or particular franchises that I like I enjoy to stream. 
Um, cause some things like fit nice and neat into a little bubble, uh, where it makes sense. Um, if people know me, you know, via streaming or even as a, you know, a podcast host, but I do have some oddball ones that kind of raise to the top that I stream, you know, fairly regularly enough to be considered uh, frequent, you know, or, or noticed. Um, so for me, I grew up, um, throughout the nineties, I was born in 1988. And so gaming was a love when I was very little. I think I received a, uh, Sega Genesis for my fourth birthday, which I still have. Um, I also played a lot of, uh, Super Nintendo at about the same time, uh, Super NES, as well as, uh, NES just a few years later. Uh, so that's kind of the roots of, my gaming history, I was definitely a Sega kid. I was I was enthralled by the blue blur, which I'm very happy to see that the Sonic movie is doing so well. And um, Sonic Mania, which was fan made, but is an excellent um, like reimagining or like remix almost of like classic Sonic the Hedgehog games, uh, because I've always been partial to Sega. Um, I didn't start out with Nintendo per se like a lot of kids did, you know, my, my age group. Um, I, I was the Sega kid. So I had my Sega Genesis. Uh, it was really the first console that was ever kind of mine, which was really cool. And I played Echo the Dolphin and Sonic the Hedgehog. I played a lot of like movie tie-in games too. Um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone were huge. So we, played a lot of like you know like the cliffhanger genesis uh film adaptation video game um true lies was another one i really liked judge dread uh things along those lines um a lot of them the more like kind of cartoon e games like um tiny tunes the uh quack shot and um tailspin was another one i played a lot of um yeah, so that's kind of like a, just a general or wide swath of the types of games I played or where I came, where I come from, like gaming wise. Um, my parents weren't terribly well off while I was growing up, and so the next console that I got was the PS One, and then it's also where I played Final Fantasy for the first time. I played Final Fantasy Seven, and was uh, immediately hooked. I've since gone back and played through all the older ones. And then I've played every single one afterwards as far as release. Even the even the MMOs like Final Fantasy XI and XIV. Um, but yeah, and then from then on, I mean, Sony kind of dominated, you know, my mind share at least. And like my video game kind of habits. So I now as a adult with, you know, a little bit of a disposable income... I've gone back and I've collected, you know, retro consoles that I didn't have a chance to play. Uh, like most recently, fallen in love with the Dreamcast. You know, I had a choice to make. It was either going to be, you know, a PS2 or uh, a Dreamcast. And I don't remember seeing much advertisement for the Dreamcast, so I'm not even sure if I really knew of it at the time. Like, I'm not going to lie. At least I don't remember. Um, but Sony was kind of on the mind and was the, the Final Fantasy uh, machine to have. So I really wanted a PS2. And so I went PS1, PS2, PS3, and now PS4. Um, the Dreamcast, like I said, I've fallen, you know, kind of in love with. And, like, piecing, like, the great games that were on the Dreamcast. I really like the, the UI on the console, the form factor of the console, the controller, um, the VMU, which is uh, their memory card that has a little, like, LCD screen on it. Um... Recently picked up Time Stalkers, which I never played, which is a great, like, RPG for the Dreamcast. I think I have Skies of Arcadia coming. I have an extra controller coming. So um, I'm borrowing a Sega Saturn from my co-host John right now so I can experience that and play through a little bit. I really want to buy one of those uh, on my own and have it uh, in my collection and be able to stream that uh, readily. And then... Yeah, we have an N64 hooked up now, and then I, we also have a Switch. So now we're definitely a lot more varied in the type of consoles we have, uh, all different eras and generations. And so especially because of that, and then just growing older, my taste in games have changed. So one of the games that I get asked about quite a bit is, like, I don't play Call of Duty 
or Battle Royale games, like hardly at all. I've tried out Apex Legends. Uh, I like how it looks, for sure. It handles really well, but just not my style of game. I'm not very good at it, and so and I don't derive a lot of pleasure from it, so I don't like to play that kind of on my own accord um, or stream it. I have friends, though, that stream, so if anybody wanted you know that kind of content, I could totally recommend people to watch. Um, Call of Duty, I dabble in every once in a while, so... I think this is like a, an unusual stereotype, but I think as men get older, they find themselves getting more and more enraptured by like history and world history and war history and things like that. Um, you know, probably from the time like teenage years, you know, it just becomes more like heightened as you get older. Um, so I have played through like Call of Duty World War II, um, I still need to go and play uh, Battlefield 1 just because playing a World War 1 kind of epic would be really interesting, I think. Uh, there's an indie game called Valiant Hearts that takes place during World War 1 and uses um, actual um, wartime letters to frame out the narrative in it, <clears throat> which is super interesting to me. Um, and then also, as a writer, I... Besides doing like a lot of freelance journalism, um, I also worked as like a novelist, you know, just in my my own time. And so, my favorite things to read and even watch, really, as far as like films are concerned, is definitely like fantasy or like science fiction. Um, and so, Call of Duty: Infinite Warfare kind of like piqued my interest, and I have played through that. But it had been quite a few years, and I didn't really play competitively. It was more for the the story and the experience and you know the kind of like world that they were building but the biggest of them all even over um my limited knowledge of call of duty or battle royale games uh is the division two uh the division two i absolutely love um i've streamed it quite a few times on twitch as well as youtube um it's a game i keep going back to and it doesn't really fit the kind of self-imposed paradigm that I have. Uh, obviously, I've described a lot of like retro games. I've described uh, RPGs, fantasy, you know, things like that. And then just kind of my loose dabblings in some of the more mainstream franchises uh, that are kind of always prevalent on people's minds. You know, we get a Call of Duty every year and Fortnite and Apex Legends have really like kind of swept the gaming community. And I have been resistant to getting into those or if I have dabbled in it it's it's kind of how I thought you know where I personally I wouldn't be as well interested in it but the division two kind of like checks all those boxes off I mean it's an online multiplayer game it's squad based uh, more cooperative than I mean you can do some pvp stuff in the dark zone and uh and other areas of the game but I was always a huge Tom Clancy fan. It's kind of what it boils down to. So when I got my PS1, one of the... And I still have these copies, too. One of the fondest memories I have on that console was playing um, Rainbow Six for the first time, as well as, like, Rainbow Six Lone Wolf. I think Raven Shield was another one. I don't have that one, per se, but I have the, the prior two that I mentioned. And... I just get that distinct but, like, obviously modernized vibe from The Division 2. Um, it's got a lot of RPG elements in it, which kind of pulls me in. And then um, it's a looter shooter, which those are, like, the, the few shooters that I, like, consistently play. Like, give me, a, a, like, a looter shooter or, like, a very arcade -y kind of shooter, and I'm down. You know, give me, like, Wolfenstein and Doom for that arcade kind of FPS. Give me, you know, Borderlands and, the you know, now The Division uh, for that looter shooter experience, because it is a good hybrid of uh, shooter and RPG. So I think that's probably, you know, the reason I love the Division 2, you know, more so than some of these other uh, types of games that I don't dive into. Like, it does seem kind of like idiosyncratic, but uh, that's kind of where it stems from, you know. My love of the PS1, which is probably my favorite retro console with the Genesis quickly behind it. Uh, 3D gaming, just especially at the age I was, really like hooked me more than, um, you know, 
16 bit or 32 bit gaming did. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of it in a nutshell. That's why I really, you know, enjoyed those games, like, or that game in particular franchise. And those are the types of games I play, like, regularly on my own or, you know, streaming wise. So, uh, that's about it for, like, kind of questions or comments or anything along those lines. Um, yeah, most of the most of the questions pertain to AS Inquisitor itself, what we do, what it is, um, how long we've been doing it, what we plan to do, uh, where we're at, you know, things like that. So I'm glad to have been able to cover that in this podcast. Um, and then the kind of like leftover questions usually then pertain to the the types of games I play and why. And then how there are just some kind of idiosyncratic ones that don't seem seemingly make sense with what I traditionally uh, stream or play. So thank you, thank you for bearing with me as we, we get closer and closer to the actual topic of our show. Um, so with my co-host, uh, Ariel and John, what I do now is I will pitch them ideas, or they will pitch me ideas, either or, and we'll kind of settle on, like, what, at least in broad terms, what topics we want to cover, or, like, types of games, or newsworthy items, you know, and what ends up happening is, is I have a shared uh, Google Doc for scripts with John, that's just FTG, and then I have two shared Google Docs with Ariel for Rage Quit and 64 Bits of Rage. Uh, as we come up with topics, um, either myself or them, that we will like put those topic headers into the Google Docs, kind of frame out the next few episodes. Uh, if it's more evergreen content, it'll obviously be pushed out a little bit. If it's more current with news going on right now, then we'll... Uh, bump that up in the show list and that'll be something that we try to work on, you know, more, more pressingly, like right away. Um, and then my job is they, cause they both work. Um, you know, John owns like 12 and a half percent of the company or something like that. And then, um, Ariel and I, you know, she has the, the remainder 50% of that. And then I have a full 50%. And, and that's just like the creative input put into it kind of like works. That's how that percentage kind of works out. But anyways, um, and then I write the scripts. So I go through and they're not hard written. You know, I'm not writing like John says this, Anthony says this, or Ariel says this at this point. Um, really it's just information and like workflow. So it'll start with, um, you know, kind of like the broad kind of context. Uh, I write scripts very kind of like, I bottle in, so like an hourglass almost. So what we do is we start really big and wide, uh, maybe with like historical contents or like where the franchise or series started, and then we boil all the way down into kind of the editorial or opinionated section in the middle. We'll provide our gut reactions or, you know, maybe if it's a topic that we've thought about for years and it's something that's just kind of been rolling around in our heads, we get into the nitty gritty and have a genuine conversation. And then we expand back out to, um, you know, maybe maybe a new entry in the series is coming out or where should the series go um, or what do you think is going to happen, you know, with. Final Fantasy. How do you think Final Fantasy 16 is going to be? Is it going to be delayed because of 7? Do you think 7 Remake is actually going to release? You know, things like that. We get very broad again on the back end. And that's how I write most of my scripts. Um, the only, and then they're kind of in between. It's basically just kind of nuggets of information. You know, like sales history or years games came out or whether it was released in North America or not and why. Um, just kind of hard facts. And so then we can just kind of sprinkle those in as we do the podcast. Everything else is very organic, though. Uh, like, for example, for this uh, particular podcast, I because I'm doing it by myself, I did not write a script. And so um, I'm just going to free ball it and roll with it. 
I have like general like ideas of how I want it to go. But otherwise, that's kind of what we get to. Um, and so right now, uh, FTG has two scripts rolling. One that I did not write, this one. Um, where we're going to be talking about the uh, Yeast franchise and series. Uh, a very kind of niche, like almost, I, I'm almost like tempted to say underground kind of RPG series out of Japan that is making headway here into like Western markets finally. Um, and then the next uh, script that we have rolling, which I really want John here for because he is kind of the resident expert upon this franchise, is Fire Emblem. Uh, I have played some Fire Emblems, usually at his behest, but he will have really good insight and information. Uh, so I want to make sure that he's here for that one. Uh, however, I'm probably, of the two of us, he has a lot of familiarity with Yeast. Uh, I'm not going to lie, but I'm probably a little bit more gung-ho about it than he is. So that's why I decided to cherry-pick this topic in particular and do it solo, just in the interest of time. But yeah, that's the, the topic of episode four of FGG. Um, we're going to be discussing Yeast. And for those of you that don't know, uh, I, I loosely just hit on it. But Yeast is a action RPG, kind of along the lines of Zelda. Um, it's just as aged of a franchise as Zelda, Final Fantasy, um, Ultima, Fantasy Star. Uh, it is in that realm. So... It's not, it's not a franchise that, you know, has only kind of made a small blip or is, you know, so niche that it's only, you know, existed like the last 5, 10, or even 15 years. Uh, it does stem all the way back to the mid to late 80s. In varying quality, of course. Um, the very first Yeast was released in 1987, which, if memory serves correctly, that's also when the very first Final Fantasy was released. Uh, right in there, at least. And so it kind of has its place as far as influencing um, even modern RPGs uh, because it coexisted alongside these other just kind of titans um, that we still know of today. I mean, Final Fantasy and Zelda are just huge brands for those companies, you know, for Nintendo and Square Enix. And they really, they, I mean, they drive sales. They drive public interest, um, you know, for good or, or for bad, really. I mean... Zelda has definitely weathered, like, PR um, over the decades a lot better than Final Fantasy has, but um, whether whether your thoughts about Final Fantasy are good or bad, it really doesn't matter because uh, it's still on everybody's lips, you know, as new releases come out or things are announced and things like that. Uh, Yeast kind of stood shoulder to shoulder um, with those titans, and so... That's why I wanted to talk about it this podcast. That's why I kind of wanted to like dive into the nitty gritty. And we're going to go um, by release. Uh, we'll go in order. So we're going to start with uh, Yeast 1, which like I said, uh, 1987. And then Yeast 2 was 1988. So the year of my birth. And it was actually called the final chapter, which is kind of funny. Um... Yeast 1 and 2 are more specifically bumper RPGs. So if you guys don't know, guys and gals, if you don't know, uh, bumper RPGs is where you physically move your sprite, physically in the sense of virtually physically, <laughs> and you just kind of ram them into another sprite to cause damage, um, which is like the most like rudimentary kind of action RPG that you can have. Um, but they're specifically called bumper RPGs because they're like bumper cars. The sprites are just slamming into each other to cause damage. Very difficult to navigate like that way. Very difficult to attack with any sort of like accuracy. Um, more often than not, you would blatantly miss and not know why or you would be struck and not really know why. I mean, it just leaves too much of a gray area too much interpretation uh, to make it a really, like, solid, like, RPG with, like, high levels of, uh, like, strategy involved. 
Uh, I personally don't recommend starting there. Um, if it's a franchise you really get into, of course, you want to know everything about it. Um, you want to know the legacy of it. You want to be able to say or even just have that deep familiarity with it. You know, that I played every single one of them kind of an attitude. If you get to that kind of level with this franchise and you haven't played it before, so you're just kind of diving in, but you do eventually get there, then that makes sense. Um, I would not recommend to start there, though. It is very archaic, unfortunately, and difficult to play. And I think it kind of saps the fun out of it. And so there are far better ones to play. There's even, re like, complete remakes of older ones that are phenomenal. Um, so I would recommend, you know, you... As, as we get to it, I will I will throw in my two cents and, and let you know if you uh, should kind of start here. It's also worth noting, um, in my opinion, Yeast is split kind of down the middle. So there's kind of like the old school design of Yeast and gameplay and even aesthetic. And that's like camp one, we'll say. Um, I enjoy those ones as well. I enjoy both camps, just throwing that out there. Um, but there are some people who only like kind of that design. Uh, you traditionally just play as the uh, protagonist. That's it. Um, it's an action RPG, so you have, like, limited, like, techniques or skills, um, a lot of, like, upgrading or purchasing, you know, a new weapon, a new shield, or a new piece of armor. And then... Some kind of Metroidvania elements in it, where you meaning that you have to like get an item within the area that you're currently in in order to get to the next area because you need said item to, you know, be able to jump further or to scale ice walls or to shoot a beam of light to reveal like a secret passageway, you know, things along those lines. Very, very Metroidvania. You have to have that that almost MacGuffin to get to the next area to be able to, like, proceed. Uh, after Yeast 1 and 2, of course we get to Yeast 3. That only makes sense. I guess not all series work that way. Um, uh, Wanderers from Yeast. Uh, I did not play this uh, when it initially came out. This is kind of the start, though, to that kind of first camp that I was mentioning, that Metroidvania kind of style, that um, pixelated aesthetic, playing just as one character, uh, more action RPG rather than the bumper RPG mechanics of uh, Yeast 1 and 2. And I do now own a actually complete copy of the Super Nintendo version, and I have, like, dabbled with it a little bit. However, there is a kind of, like far superior version. So, uh, years later, uh, Yeast 3 Wanders from Yeast was remade, and it's called Yeast the Oath and Felgana. And this is oftentimes a lot of Yeast fans, uh, like, favorites. I, I believe it's John's favorite Yeast game. No, I, I take that back, sorry. It, that is, um, Ark of Nephitism is his favorite. This is probably, like, second or third for him. Um, I just recently started playing, uh, this version in particular, cause it is a remake of Yeast 3, which I, which I just said I had, a, on the Super Nintendo. Um, you can play Oath of Felgana on, uh, Windows, um, and you can also play it on the PSP or the Vita, which is really cool. So, I believe John... Played it initially on the PSP, and then he has a Windows version of it now. Um, for me, I'm not, like, huge into PC gaming. Um, so I am playing the uh, PSP version um, on the Vita is how I'm doing it. Same kind of style. Definitely updated so that the mechanics and the controls are a lot tighter. Um, you really get a sense who the main protagonist is, uh, Adol. Adol Christian is like the main uh, protagonist for nearly all of the Yeast games, except for some of the side ones. Um, 
It has those got Metroidvania kind of component into it. It's got beautiful kind of pixel art. He's got his mainstay kind of companion, Doji, who's always, you, he's almost always with him on his um, adventures. And they go back to uh, Doji's hometown. And it's kind of like a, like a Germanic, like Bavarian um, styled city. And of course, something happens that kind of draws the the two protagonists, you know, into conflict, into the saving the day mode. And you get to meet this kind of wide cast of characters. You get to learn about Doji's um, backstory a little bit more. Um, And then it just kind of does the best of the best of those kind of Camp One uh, mechanics that I mentioned earlier. Um, It is a good point to dive into if you like older style games like and that pixelated kind of aesthetic uh, which I do but I know some more modern gamers don't and that is perfectly fine Um, then this would be a good one for you to kind of to start into Um, you really get a feel like I said for Adol Christian um, how that character is kind of framed out as he's a a red-haired adventurer and the the company exceed that is like doing these games um, have supposedly found the long lost journals of Adol Christian. And then each game represents one of his travel logs or one of his journals. And so it's a self-contained story and Adol Christian then later, um, and this isn't depicted in the games, but disappeared in his sixties exploring Antarctica. And no one knows what happened to him. And then hundreds, if not thousands of years later, they came across uh, his journals and uh, it sparked a new wave in adventuring because adventuring is not like a um, like a profession that like hardly anyone has or even knows of. And so that kind of adds to the mystique of Adol Christian and uh, helps in some cases propel like the story forward. Uh, Oath of Elgana, like I said, it's just, it's just a great one to like start in. If you like kind of older style games, like it's a perfect kind of jumping off point. I wouldn't recommend again starting with Yeast Three. It's uh, Progenitor uh, wanders from Yeast. Uh, it's a little rough to play. It is playable though, uh, far more playable than uh, Yeast One and Two. At least in my opinion, uh, it is more action RPG than the bumper RPG. Um, but we have a wonderful remake, so that's a little easier to obtain. So it makes more sense to dive into um, Oath of Elgana. Although I do have to say that my copy of Yeast 3 Wanders from Yeast is uh, quite beautiful. Still has the cardboard case, the manual, and all that good stuff, and it plays wonderfully. So, if you can get a hold of it, you see it at a garage there or something. Scoop that up; it is worth something. Um, afterwards, we get uh, two versions of Yeast Four. So we get Mass of the Sun and Dawn of Yeast, which are kind of the black sheep, even more so than Yeast um, Book One and Two. Uh, in the sense of, there, I they don't believe they were released here in North America, and then there has not been remakes of them. Um, yeah, so it was originally made for the PC Engine, so CD-ROM, and they plan to bring it over on the uh, the Genesis as well as the Sega CD, uh, but it it never really happened. Um, I guess there was a remake of Master of the Sun for the PlayStation 2 titled Yeast 4 Master of the Sun A New Theory uh, that version I have not played of um, I know Yeast fans are well in the gen- and that, the, so the PS2 version that I mentioned was uh, Japan only so that's why I haven't played it um, however Yeast fans are definitely clamoring to see a remake done because they've remade quite a few of the older ones already that have done really well, um, kind of in the the old and new way. And so it would be really cool to see kind of this lost, like, black sheep 
uh, finally be remade. Um, again, if you can get a hold of a copy of this, uh, as far as like a collector sense is concerned, um, yeah, you'd definitely be able to offset it to a, a yeast fan for quite a bit. So if you find one by chance, hang on to it and do some uh, price checking on eBay or Amazon if you're into that kind of scene. I don't sell, like, I'm mentioning, like, hey, you know, scoop this up so you can, like, turn a profit on it. I actually personally don't do that. Um, I'm, like, an eternal collector. I really don't, like, sell much. I just want it for, like, posterity's sake kind of a thing. Um, but I, I actually don't really have much to say on Yeast 4. Um, the gameplay via the Wikipedia says that it returns to the style of play used in Yeast 1 and 2. Um... Yeah, and it says, and he attacks enemies by running in them to cause damage. So it sounds like Yeast 4 went back to the bumper kind of styled RPG, which I think would be very difficult to, to play nowadays. I know Yeast 1 and 2 for sure are very difficult to play. So if this is pretty much along the exact same lines, um, it would be really, really difficult. Uh, also to the note, the reception of the PlayStation 2 version of Yeast 4 um, the gaming magazine, the Japanese gaming magazine, uh, Famatsu gave the PS2 version of the game a 25 out of 40 stars, so, or score. So not, not a lot of, like, kind of faith even in the, um, uh, the remake of it in that instance. Uh, there was also a novel prequel and two different manga versions uh, that were created based off of use 4. Um, so if, if you are a fan or you're, you're thinking about becoming a fan, um, keep your eyes out. See if they actually do eventually create a remake of it. Because that might, that might be something that'll grab, grab the interest of people who enjoy Japanese RPGs and action RPGs and, or maybe just Yeast fans. Uh, we might actually get to see uh, a remake of this because they have done it quite a bit. Yeah, it is unusual. There is another game called Yeast 4 as well. Um, called The Dawn of Yeast. They share the same setting. Uh, two different studios did them, though. Um, and they're very unique compared to one another. So we'll see if we would get, like, remakes of the two games, like, in a collection. Or if they would, you know, cherry pick the one that received better was received better overall originally. Um, we yeah, we'll find out. Okay, on to Yeast 5. The Lost... I always, like, butcher this. I think it's just Keffin, not Keefin. Uh, Lost Keffin, Kingdom of Sand. Personally, this one has always intrigued me. Um, I like the title. I'm not gonna lie. I do judge books by their covers. That's why they have covers, in my opinion. Um, I don't know, Lost Keffin, Kingdom of Sand just sounds, like, super fascinating, in my opinion. Like, it conjures up, you know, like a Ad Atlantean, almost, uh, vibe to it. Or, like, Indiana Jones, like, something along those lines. Um, this is another one, just like Yeast 4, where I really don't have... Um, a lot of information on it. I have not played this one. Um, again, a Japanese only release, and it also hasn't been remade. Um, there was a PS2 remake of this akin to Yeast 4 uh, that came out 2006. So it sounds like they really were kind of into like remake mode fairly early, you know, just a few generations ago. But again, they were only Japanese releases. Um, so it did release on the Super Famicom, so which would be akin to our Super Nintendo, um, as well as the PS2 in a remake much later in 06. Um, apparently it retains the overhead view that all of the prior Yeast games had, didn't change stuff up. Um, this is when it really kind of got back into its action RPG roots. So Adol, uh, you know, 
you hit a trigger or a button to swing a sword. And then he's also given the ability to jump and then defend with a shield. And then a new magic system is uh, introduced in Yeast 5, which you charge up spells by holding a button, and then they're cast. And then Ada must level up physical skills and magical skills separately. Um, this is more closer to, you know, that, that pixelated Metroidvania action RPG kind of like realm that Yeast kind of slipped into past the bumper RPGs of, uh, one, two, and four. And so they, these are probably kind of the seeds that were sowed to create kind of that version of Yeast that we, we know today. Uh, this is another one, probably over Yeast 4, in my opinion, that should be remade so that we can play it, either on a handheld or PS4 or Switch or something along those lines. I doubt it would come to the PSP and Vita um, like they did for a bit, but it would it would be awesome to be able to play it on the Switch or PlayStation 4 or 5 or um, you know something along those lines. But like a, cr a complete remake, you know, I'd be fine with the uh, pixelated art and just play through a new adventure of Adols that I haven't experienced or read about much, say for on wikis. I think that would be super interesting. Uh, sound off in the comments if you agree, if you're a huge Yeast fan, uh, most likely bigger than myself. Uh, let me know which uh, Yeast games you would like to see remade, um, whether you kind of agree with my assessment or uh, there's other ones or even a remake of a remake kind of a thing. You'd like to see those kind of PS2 versions that released in Japan remade. Uh, here for you know a global release or a North American release, uh, I'd be interested to, to have a, a conversation uh, about it or have some more knowledge. Uh, always more knowledge. Okay, that brings us to Ye Six. Uh, this is kind of getting into. We're getting closer and closer, obviously, as we're making jumps through time. Uh, to modern yeast games. The most modern like style of yeast games within that franchise is fairly new. Uh, it's really only like really represented in um, the last two core yeast games, and then we kind of have some transitional pieces. Um, but yeast six, the Ark of Nepotism, which I mentioned before, is my co-host John's. Uh, favorite Yeast game, and I played a little bit of it, actually. He had it on his um, laptop, so I know it released uh, via Windows, and I got to play it. It's very similar to the Yeast 3 Wanderers from Yeast remake, uh, Oath of Ogana. Um, again, pixelated art. Uh, you still play as Adol Christian. It's a solo kind of adventure. Um... It is kind of heralded as, like, one of the best, if not the best, uh, like, old-school style of Yeast games. Looks beautiful because of that uh, pixel aesthetic and that pixel artwork. Um, it does kind of the best of the best, at least, like, up to that point, as far as how it does Metroidvania and, like, upgrading and magic and leveling. Um, and then the story is... Uh, really well done and kind of sets the tone for future stories like future tropes that they ended up using you know regularly you know like the start to the game or the prologue to the game always kind of like follows the six format um not all the time but a good 90 percent of the time it does um, introducing, uh, really well-rounded NPCs and extra characters for, you know, dialogue and fleshing out kind of like the backstory and making it feel like a very lived-in world and providing kind of that humanity to Adol and, um, like rounding it out very nicely with gameplay, with its aesthetic, and then with its narrative. Uh, there is a PS2 version of it as well. Um, that was released in North America, as well as Japan, as well as Europe. Uh, this is the first time that the release of it corresponded globally rather than the prior two remakes that were uh, Japan-only releases. So it's kind of cool to see. And then it was released on the PSP 
uh, just a year later after the PS2 versions um, in Australia, Europe, North America, and Japan, which is really cool. Um, so you can get copies of it to play fairly readily. You can get it on uh, Windows, uh, which was released worldwide 2015. That was like the most, like the latest release of uh, E6 Arc of Nepotism. Uh, but then, yeah, they did the PS2 releases. They even did a mobile release in Japan, which is kind of interesting. And then the PSP ones. Um, I will most likely uh, play it on the PSP because I enjoy legacy consoles so much. And Sony's handhelds are some of my favorite. I love playing Yeast games in particular, actually, um, in handheld mode. At least, like, this style of Yeast games, I enjoy uh, playing it that way. Uh, however, if you want kind of like a big screen or if you want to throw back to like the PS2, maybe that's what you grew up with, uh, you can get a hold of those copies. So that is an option. Um, real solid release though. Uh, this is one that I have, I've, I've dabbled in a little bit, but I haven't had a chance to play through the entire thing. Uh, I will though. And then once I do, I'll, I will probably do, um, some video content or at least a written review of, of it, uh, for AS Inquisitor. So kind of. Stay on the lookout for that if you're curious about this one. Um, okay, and then after Arkham Nef Nefetism, we get The Oath and Felgana, which, like we know, is uh, the remake of Yeast 3, Wanders of Yeast. Uh, in my opinion, the first great uh, remake of an older Yeast game. And kind of the the start to that secondary boom of remakes or re-releases uh, akin to what they did on the PS2 uh, in Japan. Uh, but this really kind of opened it up to a, like a worldwide market or like a North American market. So people really got to kind of dive into the nitty gritty and uh, see what yeast was all about. And they one of the first chances that you, as an American at least, had... Um, an opportunity to play it because we had the first, you know, couple really kind of rudimentary bumper RPGs, but we really hadn't had anything, um, you know, since they were almost all Japanese releases, um, except for Yeast 6. And so we had missed out on a bulk of Yeast games and knew very little about it unless you had, you know, a rare import or, um, and maybe at most with this scene wasn't as big as it is now, but an emulated, um, copy of it, you know, there, there are fan translations of a lot of older games. And so unless you had something along those lines, um, you hadn't experienced it. So I think it's a really like momentous kind of like, uh, title in the East franchise because it just, it's, it's like the floodgates have been cracked open a little bit. You know, before there wasn't even a stream, it was it was solid. It was it was damned off from us uh, culturally. And now we had a a stream that was going to just just widen and, and grow bigger so that it could kind of burst open those floodgates. Um, during the same kind of like year or two period, we get uh, yeast strategy and yeast origin. Um, I just recently started playing uh, Yeast uh, Origin. Uh, one of the titles that does not feature Adol Christian as a uh, main character. It takes place several hundred years before the uh, franchise proper. It kind of explains, uh, literally, it's in the title, it's very like eponymous, uh, The Origin of the Yeast. And throughout my description this entire time, I, I have yet to mention that yeast are like a people within this world, by the way. And they're kind of like a lost people. Um, they're like subjugated to legend. I think that's the best way to put it. And so we, in this title, get to see um, the... Like a vertical slice of the history of yeast, which is really cool. We play as uh, one of two different kind of characters. Um, in my run of Yeast Origin, I played as uh, Hugo. And it's, besides keeping the same pixel art aesthetic and 
the top-down kind of view, playing as just a single character. Um, they tweaked that for me a little bit. So they... You're essentially in a monster tower, which a lot of games have done over the years, where you go into a tower and you're slowly moving up it, and that is the main locale for the game or the main setting. Um, periodically, you come across bosses that you know prohibit you from moving up the tower, so therefore you have to like defeat them to continue moving upwards, and the goal of getting to the top of the tower or unlocking the mysteries of said tower. Uh, the maps are decent size per floor. The aesthetic does change as you move up. Uh, there'll be like water levels or like garden levels, you know, for, you know, five floors or so. Um, instead, at least in Hugo's case, um, instead of attacking with, you know, a button or trigger press to indicate like a sword action, uh, he's got, his last name is Fact. So he's, his name is Hugo Fact. And so he has the orbs of fact. And it's like a family, um, like, cursor ability, you know. There's, there's some mystery there. And you have to be facing said enemy. Or facing an enemy. I had mentioned an enemy prior. <laughs> uh, facing an enemy. And then you can shoot like orbs of or uh like beams of like magic almost or like orbs of magic out of these um orbs of fact uh to cause damage um also retains the metroidvania elements to it uh you have to find items to you know move further in the tower as well um you know outside of the boss battles boss battles are challenging but not brutal in my opinion, they're frequent enough too that it keeps it interesting. The pacing is uh, really good. Um, it's one that really holds up. Uh, this released in 2006. Um, and I am currently playing the uh, PS4 edition of it. Um, so it initially came out. Um, in Japan, and then eventually worldwide, like almost six years later. So in Japan, it released in 2006, but we really didn't have our first taste of it here in North America until 2012. Um, and then they did a few other editions. They did the PS4 and Vita edition on 2017, and then they did an Xbox One edition in 2018. Uh, I recently scooped it up for... $7.99 or $5.99, somewhere in there on the PlayStation Network. And so, and it is cross buy, so I can download it on my Vita and play back and forth. Uh, so it's a one time purchase. I don't have to buy two separate editions if I wanted to play it on the Vita or the PlayStation 4, which I always appreciate. Um, has full trophy support, which is really cool. Fills in on the backstory of the rest of the series, has interesting characters. And yeah, that one a very, very solid one. I mean, it takes what Oath of Felgana did so right and then kind of puts its own spin on it and enhances it a little bit or tweaks it a little bit. Uh, and for some people, those those tweaks are going to be better for them. Um, for other, you know, you may not be interested in uh, climbing a monster tower and uh, doing boss runs and things like that. Uh, for me, like I'm a huge, uh, as your dreams fan, which is kind of an obscure title on the PlayStation one, uh, that has the monster tower concept with some kind of Pokemon vibes to it. Cause you have familiars that you capture and take with you to fight and, uh, procedurally generated floors within, uh, as your dreams, not in, um, origin though. They are static, which is nice, uh, but I, have been kind of predisposed to like that style of game. And I really enjoy that style of game. So the tweaks that yeast origin made to the, you know, quickly becoming tried and true formula, uh, really worked for me and they vibed with me. So, um, if you enjoy those kinds of, uh, games, I would definitely recommend doing it. And it's very cheap and you can get it on modern consoles digitally, which is really cool. Some of these games obviously are incredibly difficult to get on legacy consoles or to get the legacy consoles themselves or get Japanese imports. And so it's nice that this one is also widely available. 
I think this would also be a good entry into the franchise. Uh, for granted, you wouldn't be playing as Adol Christian, who is the, the main protagonist of the series, but it does give you that foundation and kind of background, and then it does introduce you very well into the kind of standard um, gameplay, like elements and mechanics that a lot of the East games feature. So I would keep... a. Uh, an eye out on that one as well, especially if you can scoop it up for, you know, like the seven ninety nine that I scooped it up. I mean, it's practically giving it away. Okay. We're getting there. We're getting there, guys. We're, we're getting to the the end. You don't have to hear me uh, droning on over and over about uh, yeast with my professional podcasting voice, so... I don't have anybody to, to bounce off with and joke around with anymore, so it's a little less lively. It's more informative. How dare I do an informative podcast? Um, and so this brings us to Ye 7. So we're kind of back into the, the core canon of Yeast. Uh, Ye 7 is personally one of my favorites. So I have the PSP version of this game. It might have actually only been released on the PSP. Let me double check. Um, chronologically, uh, story-wise, because a lot of times the ones that focus on Adol Christian are kind of like all out of order as far as his life is concerned. Uh, the release dates don't match up to what is going on like in-universe. Um, so up until the very newest installment of Yis that hasn't come out in the West yet, um, this one is the most, like, furthest in the timeline, which is kind of interesting. Um, so it was released on Windows as well, um, worldwide, August 30th, 2017, um, but it was most predominantly on the PlayStation Portable. So it was released in 09 in Japan, 2010 in North America, 2010 in, uh, Europe, and then 2013 in Australia. And you can see as I read through these, too, as the yeast kind of umbrella or franchise is, like, encompasses more and more of the world, like, which is going to help kind of garnish, like, mind share or, uh, you know, affect um, gaming culture, uh, especially those that are, like, more inclined to play these styles of games and all like, just RPGs or action RPGs in general. So it's really cool to see that they've definitely, like, branched out and tried to wrap more and more uh, audience members or player members into it. I appreciate that, at least. Uh, Yeast 7 is kind of a, a transitional piece into what I call Camp 2, which I really haven't brought up. I talked about Camp 1 earlier. Um, this switches to more, like, what you would probably think of, of, like, a PS1, PS2 kind of era graphics. And it was on the PlayStation Portable, so that makes sense. Uh, but 3D models, um, bright colors that you get from a lot of Japanese RPGs. Um, but it still retains not the bumper RPG mechanics, but the action RPG mechanics. It also tightens up like the types of enemies and you have to do certain moves to uh, exploit you know, their weaknesses depending on the type. Uh, multiple weapon types as well. Um... You start to have a party with multiple characters in it, and so they can be controlled by AI, or you can switch to them, which is kind of interesting. Characters themselves have specific types um, that are like more effective against certain types of enemies, so you may want to, on the fly, switch to uh, another character, depending on the area where you're at, because uh, the other character in your party that you want to control is going to be more effective against... Um, a particular enemy type that is uh, prevalent in that area. Um, we're still following kind of Adol's adventure. Uh, Doji's there as well. Um, you have like SP is kind of like the, it's almost like MP. And, you know, it's something that like, um, like fuels your techniques or your skills. Um, and then they also enhance the kind of guard mechanics. So instead of just holding out your shield, uh, you can, if you time it correctly and you defend with your shield right as you get attacked, um, you get what's called a flash guard, which is prevalent in all the games after this. And 
uh, it results in like a stagger of the enemy. However, if you flub the timing on that, then you take a critical hit. So it's kind of a risk reward system uh, built into the back end of the defense mechanics of your characters, which is really cool. Um, so they really kind of like flesh out. And like I said, in my opinion, this is more like kind of a transitional piece or game uh, to modern East games. We still have the Metroidvania kind of aspects, uh, but we've lost like the pixel artwork. Um, we've started to build out a party. And the narrative, though, is still kind of structured the same as like old ones. Um, and then they've layered in, you know, like I said, all these different like enemy types and character types and like um, skills and using SP and things along those lines. Um, it is probably the first kind of into this what I call the camp two of yeast like fans or style. I really enjoy this one. Um, it's one of my personal favorites. Um, not my, not my top dog, but, um, it's really interesting and something that has its place kind of like Otha Felgana does in the, within the franchise, you know, a, not necessarily a remake of course, but just the, the importance of it, like that, that wide net that XCDN was kind of like casting and, uh, the changes, to like modernize the franchise as it was coming more westward. I think it's definitely kind of a a seminal piece uh, within the franchise. Now we're going to get on to my personal favorite. Um... That was weird. I'm doing timestamps, and uh, this one happened at one eleven eleven, so it was just one 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 one. It's unusual. Um, so, Yeast Memories of Celsetta is the next one. Uh, Memories of Celsetta is a remake as well, akin to Oath of Ogana, which is super interesting. So, oh, it's not a remake. I'm sorry. I was thinking of Ofla Fogana because I just brought that up. My bad. Um, Memories of Silsetta takes a place a year after the events of Yeast 2, the bumper RPG one, um, and about a year before uh, Oath and Fogana. Kind of put it in, like, context as far as, like, chronologically. Um, it essentially takes the place of Yeast 4, Mask of the Sun, and Dawn of Yeast. And we kind of talked about how it would be cool to see a proper remake of it. This isn't... Memories of Silsetta is not a, like, proper remake of these games. It's almost like instead of this happened, like rewriting history. Um, that's why I think it's probably a little far-fetched that we will get a remake of Yeast 4, even dependent on, like, how they were originally received, just because we have memories of Solsetta. Um, that's why I was more intrigued by a remake of Yeast 5, um, because 4 and 5 are really, like I said, just kind of the black sheeps of the Yeast family, and so... As a fan, I would be really curious as, like, maybe a side story to see a remake of Yeast 4, but I doubt it'll happen just because of Memories of Silsetta. Memories of Silsetta is the first one that I actually played, like, through and through. Um, and I fell in love with the franchise. So when I got a PlayStation Vita, I was looking up uh, just great games to play on it. Uh, specifically RPGs, I think, at the time. So I recommended, like, Persona 4 Golden, which I already had and had played through. Um, and then a, a few others, like Soul Sacrifice, which I really enjoy. Uh, but also on that list was Memories of Solsetta. And I was like, and I watched some, like, gameplay footage of it on YouTube and uh, read some reviews. And I was like, this seems right up my alley. Like, this seems like a franchise, that, like, at the top of the episode, you know, that kind of fits into my paradigm, paradigm unlike... Uh, the Division 2 or, you know, Call of Duty or Battle Royale games. And so I I scooped it up. I still have my copy. 
and played through it, and I absolutely loved it. And that's what made me a Yeast fan. Um, it has that Yeast 7 kind of vibe and feel to it, uh, as far as the... 3D like sprites instead of the pixelated sprites. It's a little bit more open world. They really start to invest in like the like because you're an adventure, like mapping the world around you um, and making sure that the entire map is unfogged and that you find everything. There's great like crafting kind of elements in it as well. Um, you pick up a lot of like herbs or wood or things like that and you can use those um, to your benefit. Um, you play as Adol again, which is really cool. It's kind of has a split focus on like a party mentality as well as um, a solo kind of adventure. It also breaks the trope of a lot of yeast beginnings where there'll be like a um, you'll be on a ship and it'll like run aground or it'll sink. That's, that happens a lot in the prologue of yeast games. This one doesn't, um, you experience amnesia and then you're trying to explore, you're trying to essentially retrace the steps that you've already taken, but you don't know any of the characters that you come across, but they know of you because you had already been there. But as the player character, you know, you don't know who they are either, which is kind of an interesting framework. Um, Doji is prevalent as well. They introduce a lot of awesome NPCs that one of which in particular is actually featured in a later installment, which is really cool. And uh, you get kind of, again, another kind of vertical slice of the, the, the people yeast and what happened to them and like an ancient city that has been covered by a forest and it's just all very intriguing. It's very Indiana Jones. It's very kind of uncharted. It's like the sense of exploration and discovery is uh, not heavy handed in this game, I would say, but it's vital to the gameplay and just intriguing. Um, it never, in my opinion, goes too far with it where it's just kind of grinding to uncover a map or it's just like uninteresting information. Uh, everything all kind of like pieces together really well. Uh, this one was released on the Vita in Japan in 2012 and then North America 2013 and then Australia and Europe in 2014. Uh, it's also on Microsoft Windows. There was a worldwide release uh, in 2018. And it is coming to the PlayStation 4, which I'm really excited about. They have a kind of cheap-ish collection. It's like $40, and you get the remastered version of Yeast Memories of Celsetta with all these like little collectibles and stuff. And it's coming out on the PS4. Um, just at the end of this month, it'll be a day after this podcast releases, actually. So I'm recording this on the 14th of March. This podcast is going to release on the 30th. And then you'll be able to play the PS4 version, my personal favorite Yeast game, uh, partially because of nostalgia as well. Uh, and it was my entry point um, on March 31st, which is really cool. So if you have a chance to, uh, to check it out or scoop up a copy, it's only $40. And I, I think that's, uh, I'd pay more for it. I'd pay the full $60 for it. Um, and then if you can get a physical copy, you get a lot of extras kind of with it. So I would highly recommend, uh, I, would, I would urge you to get a physical copy if you're interested and you want something to play. Uh, we are rather close, though, to the Final Fantasy VII remake release. Uh, if you're a Fallout fan, the Wastelanders uh, free DLC is releasing April 3rd. And then we're just after uh, Doom Eternal and Animal Crossing just by 11 days. So there's a lot of good stuff to play in there. So uh, maybe just kind of keep it in the back of your mind and you know think about it the next time you want to dive into an rpg and you're unsure of what to play you know maybe it's summertime maybe it's the fall you know there's a lot of rumors that because of the coronavirus that console manufacturing is going to be pushed back therefore the release of new consoles is going to be pushed back so maybe you'll hit a dry spell and want an action rpg to play and something new um i would urge you to check out yeast memories of salsetta i think it's another great um, entry point into the series. Um, it's also, in my opinion, distinctly in Camp 2. 
and it is the new version of yeast. You know, we have strayed so far away from the um, Metroidvania kind of aspect of it, the pixelated aesthetic, the just playing as Adol. Uh, now we have 3D sprites and worlds and uh, levels. We have the different enemy types, uh, character types, the flash guard. Um, trying to think. Oh, the the mapping and like um, uh, gathering kind of system uh, are really kind of in full swing here. So it's a, it's a lot different. You know, it's still you can see the tie in to the the prior yeast entries, but it really kind of came into its own again with a different style. And so for you, you may be more interested in the older versions of yeast and not so much the newer ones or vice versa. You may prefer the newer style because it is more akin to modern JRPGs and not be as interested in the, the pixelated, you know, kind of top down uh, action RPG. It might be too aged for you and both are perfectly reasonable. You know, you don't have to, to fall specifically in one camp you know pick and choose play what you like i always say okay so that brings us to yeast 8 so yeast 8 released in 2016 uh probably one of the closest uh releases that we had in comparison to uh japan and north america uh this one i bought about two years later, 2018 is when I scooped this up. Uh, I did buy it full price. Um, there's a lot less kind of releases on the PSP and Vita. Uh, almost none at all for the PSP. We pretty much just get small indie games on the Vita now, uh, which is how I was primarily playing the East franchise before. Um, even some of the ones that I've gone back to, I've gotten um, old copies for the PSP or digital copies and played them on the, the Vita or the PSP. Um, this one was also on the Switch. So I kind of went the um, intermediate route, the hybrid console. And it's this is a franchise that I don't really like trophy hunt for. And so I ended up playing through... Uh, Yeast 8, and it was actually the first game I beat of this year. So I must have got it, I must have got it in 2019, not 2018 then. That's what I meant. I got it in 2019, and I finished it in 2020. So I waited a little bit uh, before getting it. Uh, Yeast 8, La Cremosa of Donna, is super interesting, in my opinion. It's a gorgeous game, really leans into the 3D modeling and sprites and world um, very colorful, very dynamic, has a wonderful ensemble cast. Uh, it's gigantic. Um, a segment of that cast you can use as playable characters and swap them in and out depending on who your favorite is. Um, the AI is decent. They, they follow your commands. You're not like, it's not as if they die every two seconds and you're just kind of left by yourself or worrying about like reviving them constantly. Uh, they can't die uh if you're not controlling them which is really cool they can obviously take damage but um the only like pitfall to that is is if you're playing as say adol and then one of your compatriots or both of your compatriots die and then you die and it switches to them i i should say they, they wouldn't have died but it, they their hp drops down to one or something uh, and then you switch to them it only takes a swipe and then you're dead so there is still kind of that level of difficulty there but it's a good way to manage the AI for party mechanics, which I think is really cool. Uh, this one kind of returns to the the yeast trope where you're on a ship and you shipwreck onto an island. Um, and then it's discovering and exploring this island, which is almost like a relic of history. Uh, you find out that there is a there was a thriving civilization on this island. And then there is a crazy influx of like monsters or dinosaurs almost. I think they call them Saurians in this one or primordials. Um, yeah. So then you're trying to find a way to get off the Island and there's like a definite wall preventing you from leaving the Island, um, finding castaways 
uh, building up a uh, castaway village, uh, managing your party. There's a lot of crafting to it. There's like gifting even. Uh, there's optional bosses. You still have the same kind of like um, player character types, uh, enemy types. The flash guard uh, makes its um, a resurgence as well. Uh, upgrading your weapons and your armor because you do find a blacksmith who is a, a fellow castaway. And so you have to get special items to make her forge better. But then that in turn gives you, you know, better, better weapons and armor. So that's a focus as well. Uh, mapping out the island. There's a great kind of Easter egg. The one of the characters from Memories of Zelseta makes a return and is a castaway on uh, the island that you're on in uh, Yeast 8. And then it has a wonderful story, one of my favorite stories. It peters out a little to the end, I will admit that. The ending isn't as strong as I would like. However, the journey to get there and uh, most of the ending is very fascinating. It's interesting. It's, you know, a bonker story, but kind of believable in the Yeast universe. Um and it, yeah, it's just, it's a great all around good experience. You know, it's a good bang for your buck. It's, you know, a lengthy game on top of it, but it, it's a little slow in the beginning. And then it kind of, it really kind of bumps up after like, I would say the first act. And then you're, you're just kind of enthralled by it. And it adds in a whole bunch of like kind of layers gameplay wise and uh, exploration wise and even information wise that you're receiving. Uh, I wouldn't re recommend starting with Yeast 8, Lacrimosa of Donna, I would say to take a step back and start with, you know, Memories of Salsetta or Yeast 8, or Yeast 7, sorry. I just said, don't start with Yeast 8, and then I'm like, take a step back and play Yeast 8. No, uh, try out Yeast Memories of Salsetta or Yeast 7 if you kind of like that modern flavor of Yeast. Um, if you think you'd be more inclined for, like, the older style, go back to, uh, like, Oath of Ogana or even Yeast Origin. Arc of nepotism, if you can uh, find it. Uh, but yeah, it's, I would say it's probably like a second or good, like third choice to play if you get into the franchise. Because uh, all Yee stories are fairly self contained. So you don't need a ton of information um, prior to whichever entry you're playing. Uh, it does a good uh, job, like, contextualizing what's going on and kind of keeping it in the moment and kind of in its own little bubble. They make vague references to like the type of person or character it all is. And then every once in a blue moon, you'll get an Easter egg. That's a reference to a prior one chronologically, but it's never detrimental to the story. Like if you don't know, and oftentimes you wouldn't even be able to tell like if you hadn't played the prior entry that it's referencing and it's few and far between, but I would say dive into memories of Zelsetta seven or oath and Fogana or origin first. And then maybe as like a second or third uh, string entry into the series, uh, hit up yeast eight lacrimosa of Donna. Really good though. And Donna was a great character, by the way. She was a fantastic addition, and I wish they had figured out a way to retcon her into the series. I think that would have been really awesome. Okay, now we are on to the final entry. Yeast 9 Monstrum Knox. Um, Monstrum Knox has not released in North America yet. Uh, Yeast fans are patiently waiting for an announcement. I do have some friends who have purchased um, Japanese copies of it and played through it. Whether they've known Japanese or not, they have used either their friend's aid or uh, loose translations. It seems to be a darker uh, version of Yeast, a little bit more moody, a darker aesthetic, not as bright colors as, say, like Yeast 8 or even some of the pixelated ones. Um, it seems to retain a lot of what Yeast 7 and Yeast 8 and even Memories of Salsetta brought to the table as far as modern Yeast games. Um, but it's also added kind of like a transformation for like special powers and even changing the aesthetic of, you know, your, your character 
or characters around you, which looks really intriguing. Um, we'll see if that mechanic actually kind of functions as advertised and it really adds to the series. It's something that I've finally kind of caught up on on the series, at least enough. I mean, I obviously have some that I mentioned throughout the podcast that I need to uh, go back and play uh, just for my own sake. So I have better kind of knowledge of the franchise. However, uh, this one I will most likely purchase on day one. It'll be something that, you know, I will be all over. I won't be waiting uh, two or three years like I did with Yeast 8 or um, Memories of Silsetta or all the old, older ones that I, you know, have just now over the years gone back to and played. Uh, kind of in the same way that I have these Memories of Solceta for the PS4, uh, the remastered edition, um, pre-ordered, and that's going to be coming, and I'll be streaming it that week. So, I'm I'm incredibly excited for it. We'll see how it is. Um, I've heard it's very similar to Yeast 8, um, but that it is better. And so... I will let you guys be the judge of that upon release, and I will let myself judge as soon as I get a chance to play it instead of just watching others play it, you know, via YouTube or the the friends I mentioned that I uh, that imported it. But we'll see where it goes. Um, but I think that's that's close to a wrap. Uh, we'll do a little bit of an outro. We'll talk about yeast just kind of in broad terms a little bit, and then then we'll close her on out. That's really all I have to say about Yeast 9, Monster of Nox. So can't really dive too much into it because I haven't had it in my hands and I don't want to spoil any information if you are already super interested in the franchise and are just kind of listening and supporting, you know, another Yeast fan. So I really wanted to do this episode because niche games in my opinion, should not be niche. (laughs) Um, I think oftentimes, and let me clarify, I think oftentimes niche games are only niche because they haven't found the bulk of their fandom yet. Uh, Whether it be in Yeast case where it's been difficult to get them here in North America for a very long time, uh, or... You know, it's a smaller company that can only distribute, you know, digitally. And it may get lost in the shuffle of all the other digital releases that occur every week. Or maybe there's not enough money or it's just mismarketed, you know, for for marketing. And I think podcasters and content creators, whether you're a streamer or a YouTuber or even if you're on Mixer or, you know, whatever your bread and butter is, um, as gamers, instead of rallying behind these gigantic franchises that are always going to do well no matter what, which in turn gives you probably good viewership, um, I would urge you that you sprinkle in some of your long lost favorites. Maybe you think there's a game that you play or a franchise you love that doesn't get enough love. Um, Create content around that. Even if it's only once a week or once a month. Um, I think we need to give special shout outs. The gaming community is so diverse and interesting in its content and its people that we miss out on a lot of good things just because we get, and I do this too, get stuck into this lane where it's like I only play this one type of game or this one franchise. But, you know, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago, you played, you know, Azure Dreams or Yeast and really enjoyed it. You know, Time Stalkers for the uh, Dreamcast or Fantasy Star. And you think it's better than Final Fantasy. Like, we need to give more light to these old franchises and these more niche franchises and games and pretty much show like consumer confidence in them and share our love of gaming, which is what these platforms are all about to others that may not know. And I think that creates like a healthier environment for gamers and also can oftentimes intrigue gamers who maybe think of themselves as like more casual and stuff, or maybe not as vocal uh, because they don't see, you know, the types of games that they play represented 
And that's a shame, like, because they should be represented more and therefore people will be represented better and more. Uh, that's my opinion on it. That's why I wanted to do this episode, though. Um, if you enjoyed this type of episode, just me kind of talking into the mic at you, going over um, AS Inquisitor questions or the history of it or how we script things out or run a podcast and then, you know, the history of a franchise in, you know, an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes, uh, I'll do more of them. And you can even suggest series to me. Um, you know, hit me up in the YouTube comments section on AS Inquisitor. Uh, that's what this podcast will, will be released there or any other kind of podcast service um, that you find FGG on, which should be nearly everything. Uh, you can also leave a, a comment there if you're allowed to. And I will try and uh, get, get back to it. And, and we can definitely do a podcast uh, revolving around that. You know, that way we're just kind of sharing each other's loves of games. And even if I have to do a ton of research and I'm not terribly familiar with the franchise, I I will. For this podcast in particular, uh, FTG, I have ample opportunity. You know, I have a month between recordings and uploads to do the research and write a proper script and kind of have everything out. This one was a little more off the cuff because I know a decent amount about Yeast and have played, um, you know, over half of these titles. So that's why it was a little more loosey-goosey. But if it was something that was suggested that I didn't know a lot about, I definitely won't phone it in. I will do the research for it. But otherwise, I think that is a wrap. That is the, the history of Yeast. We went title by title, which I thought was pretty cool. Started from the beginning... Now we're at the top. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a wrap. So you can find FTG on YouTube uh, once this episode releases, or right before this episode releases, I should say. Um, it should be available on podcast services around the world. Um, our other two podcasts are already on various services. So... I personally go through, I don't pay to have a service post our podcast because I like to have as much creative control as I can over the projects that I work on. That's really just my OCD. Um, but as this releases, if you prefer to listen to podcasts, not on YouTube, but elsewhere, uh, make sure you check out, you know, Spotify, iTunes, uh, CastBox, Google Play Music, um, any podcast kind of directory you use, even, you know, Stitcher, um, all the big ones, really. And then even just some of the directories that uh, host podcasts. Uh, FTG will be there. Um, the only thing holding me back until now from doing that is is there are a hefty amount of podcasting, um, like hosting sites or like directories that require you to have at least three episodes. Well, because this is a three, usually a three hour long podcast if I have my co-host um, and it only comes out once a month, it's a little bit more timely like to get to three episodes so or more time, I should say. Not very timely. Um, so that's why it's taken so long. And also, if you like this podcast, check out uh, my wife and I's weekly podcast, Rage Quit. We cover all things Sony, as well as general video game topics. Uh, that runs an hour long and comes out every Wednesday on podcast services and every Friday on YouTube. Um, if that doesn't strike your fancy, we also host a weekly uh, Nintendo podcast called 64 Bits of Rage. That releases weekly as well. That's every Friday and then Monday on YouTube. Um, and you can get that anywhere. So I think it's hosted on at least 30 some odd different sites and platforms. So you should be able to get a hold of those too. And then hopefully as this comes out, yeah, you'll be able to subscribe to this wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, but anyways... My name is Anthony Schultz. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. This is AS Inquisitor. And like my wife would always say, remember, follow the bear. Bam, 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 bam. Peace and have a good day.